Preferably, if you can all fit in the back room, because it's soundproof, we won't hear you. Well, I want to say um, welcome to those who are on Facebook. God bless you. We're glad that you joined us. Uh, thank you for your prayers. I, when I was in uh, Palo del Car, Car, whatever they say, however they say it, I was sick, and uh, many of you prayed for me. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And, uh, I'm still recuperating a little bit, but I'm getting there. Amen. And uh, please pray for those, like I said, that you know are not feeling well today. Well, it was hard coming back to this climate. You know, it was. 83, 82 degrees, it was a nice tropical breeze blowing over the sand, and we were in our little uh, spaces on our chairs with our little tiki huts above us, you know, and we were just laying out there on the beach only to come back to this damp, cold, snowy, I think Boston got like three to four, three, six inches, something like that, and they had a lot of snow, and we had to circle around a couple of times, we had to circle around once, because they were plowing the field, uh, the uh, runways. And so, um, and, you know, we're like, what a mess to come back in. You know, I said, maybe we should just stay, you know. That would be nice. Uh, well, anyway, while I was laying on the beach and just uh, relaxing, and, uh, you know, I had put my headphones on, and I was listening to the book of Proverbs. And the, I love Proverbs. I don't know about you. But if you're a real dumb person like me, you need wisdom, listen to Proverbs. Proverbs will fill you full of wisdom, and knowledge, and understanding. Amen. I just say that kidding. I know I'm not dumb. Um, sometimes when it compares to God's knowledge, I'm dumb. But um, praise God. No, I should say all the time, not just sometimes. Praise the Lord. Well, as I was laying there on the beach, <clears throat> the Spirit of the Lord dropped this scripture into my into my heart. And um, I, uh, I had remembered a... I don't know, maybe last year sometime preaching, uh, maybe not, not even last year, maybe about four or five months ago I preached something on this area. But it's a, it's a different area of where I want to go with this, if you can, just bear with me for a moment. And the title of my message this morning is Obedience or Sacrifice. Obedience or Sacrifice. It's taken from 1 Samuel chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me there. Uh, those who are listening by, uh, by Facebook, if you have your Bibles, hope you do have a Bible. If you don't, let us know. We'll try to get you one somehow, somewhere, some way. We'll try to get one for you. Um, but uh, we're glad that you're joining us. We're glad that you're here. And so um, sit back and enjoy and, and open up your heart to receive God's Word today. But as, as I was on the beach and I was thinking on these things, and I, and I just ask, please, don't get distracted. Listen to the Word, because the devil wants to distract you from the things of God. Okay, don't get distracted. Pay attention. That's why you're here. You're only here for another hour or so. Pay attention. Don't look at the phones. Don't be texting. Don't be doing stuff like that. You see me on my phone, I'm texting. I'm texting Bob uh, things that, of how to conduct the service a little better. So if you see me on my phone, I'm not texting anyone. Okay, if you, if you need to text, then, then go outside. You know, go do something else. Uh, don't, don't come to church because I don't think God's pleased with people texting in church and not paying attention. You're here to pay attention to get God's Word in you so that you can have God's Word work through you so that you can begin to be more conformed into His image. Amen? Babies' cries do not bother me, so that's okay. Don't worry about that. Okay? Um, and that doesn't distract me. Um, obedience or sacrifice. Now, I believe God dropped this Word into my spirit, and I believe that there's, there's some real truth to this if we will adhere to it. You remember uh, two weeks ago, she's happy. Two weeks ago, I preached a message on, you know, the effective word. How to have an effective word in your heart and in your life. You remember what the, the four things were? One was listening. What was the second one? Huh? Believing. What was the third one? Speaking. What was the fourth one? Doing it. Good. Most of you knew it. And now you put it in practice. Amen? To obey is better than sacrifice. That's the scripture I want to talk about today in verse 22 of chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. 
First Samuel. You can move on to the uh, scripture. <clears throat> and the Bible says that Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Question. And that's the title of my message. Obedience or sacrifice? Which one do you think God is more concerned with in my life and in your life? Is it obedience or sacrifice? Now, I have to explain that because if you take it the wrong way, you could say, well, you're looking at it and saying, well, no, Christ's sacrifice did it all. Well, that's true. But that's not how I'm looking at this right now. And we'll get into that. But the scripture says, behold, Samuel's talking here. And he's giving a word from God. And he says, behold, to obey is what? I need some participation. To obey is what? Better than sacrifice. To hearken than the fat of rams. Well, what did he mean by that? When he made that statement, when God made that statement through the prophet, to obey is better than sacrifice, how can that, how can that be? God was the one who inst instituted sacrifices. This message this morning is not going to be so much about the main characters such as Saul and Samuel, but I want to concentrate on what one of these characters did. And that is Saul. The focus this morning is going to be on why it is important to not just believe, but also be obedient to God and to His Word, especially living in these last days before Jesus returns. There are many groups, churches, denominations, and so-called ministers that are promoting this ideology that Saul had. We'll get into that. So the first question we should be asking this morning is this. Why did Samuel say to Saul to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams? I will attempt to answer that question this morning. Why did they have sacrifices in the first place? You can go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, you know the story with Adam and Eve when they sinned. They covered themselves with fig leaves. Okay? And then God came along and started questioning them and asking them questions. How many know that God is confrontational? See, we have a, we have a Jesus out preached today in, 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 the, in the America today, in the world today. We have a Jesus that's preached that's non-confrontational, you know. Jesus loves everybody, and you know he just accepts everybody, and he accepts all of our failures, and he accepts all. That's 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 a bunch of baloney, baloney. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Okay. And so, the same thing that was going on during Saul's time, God began to reveal this to me as I'm sitting on that beach. And I was reading it, and I was going, wow. 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 The sacrifices that are in the Bible before the New Testament came were all animal sacrifices. Adam and Eve, when they were covered, when God confronted them, he said, okay, that covering's no good. You can't cover yourselves because that's not going to do it. So the Bible says he, cut, he covered them with skins of leather. Well, not to cover them with skins of leather, that means that some animal had to die. So the restoration process of Adam and Eve, or the covering of their sin, was a sacrificial covering. In other words, it wasn't something lightly. A life had to be given for them to be covered. Of course, in society we live in today, life is not really that valuable because we kill over over uh, 3 million babies worldwide in abortion. Hello? Life is not valued here because as people get older, they say, oh, just let them die. They all had their life. They're you know, in the 70s, 80s, whatever it is. They're not important anymore. They're not productive anymore. Let them die. 
Well, without them, you wouldn't be where you are today. So we don't take life seriously. We see uh, the shootings in Chicago, over almost 700 deaths since January by gun violence. So we see people just shooting people for no reason, don't care. People in a, in a hotel room shooting in Las Vegas, killing 58 people, they just don't care. People in a nightclub going into a nightclub to supposedly have their fun, whatever they call fun, and then having a gunman go in and killing many, many people in the nightclubs. Going into the movie theaters to watch a movie, simple, having a little bit of popcorn and a drink or something like that, and all of a sudden shooting breaks out and people are killed. We don't value life. And so what happens is, and the reason why we don't value life, because we because a child from the age of five till the time he graduates high school, listen to this. This is statistically true. They watch over 27,000 murders on television. We're entertained by murder. And so what happens is the more we become desensitized to life, the more it affects our spirituality. See, Abel valued life. He valued his relationship with God. That's why his sacrifice was accepted by God and Cain's was not. And so during this time with Saul, when, the, when, he, when God was saying to them, to obey is better than sacrifices, not because God didn't want the sacrifice of that time, it was because the people's attitude toward the sacrifice wasn't matching up to what it was supposed to be. To live up to that sacrifice was to go, God, was to, go to God for the year of atonement to the high priest and bring your offerings, your sin offerings, your burnt offerings, your, uh, all of the offerings that you were supposed to bring, you were supposed to bring a peace offering to God, whatever it was, for the things that you have done wrong. And God would, would cover your sin when the high priest went into the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant and sprinkled it with blood, it was to cover you for that sin. Cover you from the judgment of that sin. And so, and knowing that and having a relationship with God and loving God as the Old Testament Ten Commandments, the first commandment is you shall what? Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul. That's not a New Testament principle. That's an Old Testament principle. You love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. So God was demanding obedience even in the Old Testament. Obedience to God's commands is the true sign of your love for God. You can say, I can say we love God all we want, but if we're being disobedient, our words don't match up to our actions. And, I, and it says here, no. You can say you love God all you want. The only way you can know if you're obeying God is by knowing His Word. The Bible says, in, I believe it's 1 John, they that love me obey my commandments. You can say you love God all you want to, sideways out of your mouth. But if you're living contrary and you're in disobedience to God, guess what? See, the attitude of the Israelites during this time was, it was a nonchalant attitude toward the sacrifice. Their attitude was, God will forgive me. All I got to do is bring my goat, bring my sheep, you know, best, whatever it was, just bring it and it'll get slain. And I'm all set for next year. I can go out a whole new, another year and commit more sins. That was their attitude. So what happened was, God is the one who instituted the sacrifices. Amen? But it was to mean something to the people. It was to bring them closer to God so that 
they could see that through the Ten Commandments, they were sinful. And they needed to ask for forgiveness. But that attitude was changed. They took it for granted. They just ex expected God to forgive them no matter how they lived. Are you hearing me? The same thing is happening today in churches. People are coming to churches and saying, you know what, God's going to forgive me. They have the same attitude. They go out and they do what they want, and they live the way they, they want, and they think that God is still on their side. He's not on your side. To obey is better than sacrifice. See, Saul's time in, in Saul, they didn't want to hear God's voice. But if you know the story, and I don't want to go into all the story between Saul and, and uh, Samuel. Samuel told Saul, he says, Samuel, Samuel told Saul, he said, I'm going away, he said, I'll be back, but you hold on. You wait for me. Okay? And I'm paraphrasing here just to kind of keep the story moving. And so what happened was, while Samuel was away, and Samuel spoke a word of God to him, he told him, you just stay right here. Don't do anything. He says, when, when I leave, he says, you're going to go against uh, the Phoenicians, I think, or the Philistines, whatever it was. He says, I want you to kill them all. Listen, listen now. God said, kill them all. The fathers, the mothers, the children, everyone, even the king, Agag. Don't leave one alive. So Samuel goes away. What does Saul do? goes and he kills most of them, but he takes the best of the flock. Not only does he take the best of the flock, but he lets the king live. Do you understand what I'm saying? How do we affect that today? There are things in our lives that we continue to continue to let go in our life, and we don't kill them. God says, you've got to get rid of these things. You've got to slay these things. Don't leave them in your life. Don't let them stay in your life thinking that you can still be a servant of mine and be disobedient because partial obedience is still rebellion. Are you hearing me? Partial obedience is still rebellion. And so anyway, he goes and he comes back and he says, okay, What's this bleeding of the sheep I hear? Oh, he says, I, I started the sacrifices, you know, and I took these sacrifices from, from, the, from the enemy and, you know, the animals that they gave him. We're just offering the Lord thanks. It was good to offer the Lord thanks, but it wasn't the right heart. It wasn't the right way. And that's what's happening in the church today. You've got the Joseph princes. You've got all these Guys out there talking about grace, grace, grace. You've got people on Facebook talking about grace, grace, grace. They don't know what they're talking about. They're talking about some Baptist theology that says once saved, always saved. doesn't matter how you live. You just go to God and God, because of God's grace, is going to save you. That's not popular, pre popular preaching, but that's the truth. It doesn't matter how you live because we're all covered by grace. They even go to the extent of saying you don't even have to confess your sins anymore because grace covers it all. I don't know what Bible they're reading. But my point is this. They were continuously walking in disobedience to the voice of God and thinking that they were okay with God. Are you hearing me? That was the condition of the sacrificial system. Their hearts weren't right. They were going to offer to God their sacrifice the way they wanted to, when they wanted to, how they wanted to, and it was just too bad for God. God would have to accept it or too bad for him too. And I tell you, that's how some Christians live. Some Christians, 
well, this is the way I am, and this is how this is me, and this is how I am. And if, you know, really? I thought God called you to change you. I thought God transformed you. I thought God gave you a new nature. Why is why put on the old, take off the old, put on the new? Why is he telling us to do that? Because God wants us to be obedient. God wants us to be obedient. If you will, please, put up Exodus 19, verse 5. Is this helping anybody? Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice. Where's God's voice? Where do you find God's voice today? But guess what? If you don't read it, come on. If you don't read the Bible, you're not going to know God's voice. Well, pastor, you know, he's, he speaks in my name. Yeah, okay, he's going to speak what's in there. I tell you, God don't bless laziness. Hello? Sometime my wife will ask me a question, you know, honey, can, can you tell me where this is? I said, no, go look it up. Is that, am I being mean because I don't want to help her? No. Is it because I don't have the answer? No. Is it because I want to help her, and I've done this all my life, haven't I? And you know what that's made my wife? A studier. That made her disciplined. Okay, my, when my wife stands up behind this pulpit and preaches, she spends at least 16 to 20 hours of study. At least. Maybe more. She locks herself in her bedroom, no TV, and studies and prays. We need to do that. We need to be obedient to God's voice. When I'm up here preaching, it's not just to preach on Sunday morning. I can do better things somewhere else. It's not just to hear my voice come and hear a lovely sermon and, oh, that was great, Pastor. Yeah, that was a powerful word of God. Yeah. You know, jump up and down, get excited, hallelujah, shake a little bit, quake a little bit, you know. That's all good and that's all fun to do and that's all part of worship, you know, but. Man, when it gets down to the, to the nitty gritty, it's obedience or sacrifice. Exodus 19.5. Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above, above all the people of the earth. How are you a peculiar treasure to God? How are you a peculiar treasure to God? Obeying His Word? How your peculiar treasure is, the world is darkness and you are light. What happens when light over, overshadows darkness? Darkness disappears. Being a peculiar treasure is being a reflection of who God is. You become more and more like Jesus. Are you becoming more and more like Jesus? Really? Are you? Isn't that what we sing? To be like Jesus? To emulate him? To be more like him in his, in his attitude, in his thinking, in the ways of God? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Well, then why are we still remaining in our attitudes? Why, is, why, are, we still, why are we still promoting our philosophies and our opinions? Notice when Jesus had, they asked Jesus a question, what did, he, what did he do? He always pointed them back to the Father. Jesus didn't have a personal opinion. He said, the words that I speak, I hear from my Father, and those are the words, I only speak those words. We would have less fighting, less quarreling, less flesh, if we would just shut our mouths and listen and obey God. Deuteronomy 11.1. Deuteronomy 11.1. 1.
Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments sometimes. Do you have a translation up there that says sometimes? Now, that's OT. That's Old Testament. Always. In other words, your heart should always, my heart should always want to keep it, his charge, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments. Our heart should always want to do that. Oh, Pastor, you know the Word of God says your know, heart is wicked above all things. Who can know it? Yeah, but it gives you a new heart. If you're a Christian, if you've been born again, you have a new heart. He takes out that heart of stone and he puts in a heart of flesh. You have a new heart. Out of the heart come the issues of, thank you, Debbie, issues of life. Out of the heart come the issues of life. Psalm 128, verse 1. Why is it important to obey? Blessed is everyone. Say blessed. How many want to be blessed? I'm not talking financially. I'm just saying, how many want to be blessed? If you want to be blessed, Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord, that walks in his ways. Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord, and that walks in his ways. You know what? You'll never walk in God's ways if you don't fear him. See, that was the Israelites' problem during Saul's and Samuel's time. The people lost the fear of God. They, uh, they just took the sacrifice for granted. They didn't apply the sacrifice for, in, the, in the reality of what it was. They just took it as a tradition. We've, we've, we as Christians have just made coming to church a tradition. Coming on Monday, coming on Wednesday, coming on Sunday. It's just a tradition. We go in the same, we come out the same. We go in the same, we come out the same. Come on, somebody. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You come to hear the Word of God. You come to take what God says on Sunday morning and go home and talk about it. Listen to it again on, on Facebook or, or on uh, our website. Listen to the message again. You know, meditate. How many, I know, let me, I, you know, when we had Thanksgiving, right? Everyone had Thanksgiving somehow, somewhere. You ate something somewhere, right? You know, when you have a good meal, isn't it nice to go back for a second? Huh? You go, oh, man, I didn't get enough of that turkey. I didn't get enough of that gravy, man. I didn't get enough of that sweet potato, man. You know? I, I didn't get enough of that, that, that uh, 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 well, stuffing. Man, I'm going to put some more gravy on it, you know? Ooh, that was good, huh? Go back for a second. You do that with God's? You do that with God's word? Or do you just go home after Sunday morning and forget all about it? See, the thing about it is you need to keep eating. Good stuff, man. John 14, 23. Let's bring it to the New Testament now. John 14, 23. I'm going to give, I'm going to give you these, John, uh, Tom, so you can have them. All right? So if you want to just write them down. We'll go one at a time, so don't everybody skip to them. John 14, 23. James 1, 22. Luke 9, 23. And Romans 8, 14. Luke 9, 23. And don't anyone yell out bingo, please. Bingo, bongo. Yeah. John 14, 23 says this. Jesus answered said unto him, If a man love me, conditional clause, if, he will keep my words. And my Father will. Wait a minute. It's 
So what he was saying, that if you want God to love you, you've got to love Jesus and keep his word. We all agree with that? That's what it says? If a man love me, Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. That's pretty simple. I mean, you may, some of you may be having a hard time digesting that, but you know, well, God, but God loves everybody. Yeah, okay. And we will come unto him and make our abode. You know why you don't sense God's presence? You know why you don't have God's presence with you? It's easy to say we love God, but do we do what he says? Are we listening to his word? To obey his voice is better than sacrifice. Well, you know, Pastor, you know, I may not, I may not be living right, I may be doing everything, right, but I give my tithe and offering. I give my sacrifice. You know, I go out every every Tuesday and I feed the poor. You know, I, I you know I, I I do things for people for free. Thank you. You can never repay God. But the, here's the point: obedience or sacrifice. Which one does God want? Obedience. He wants us to be obedient. But he says, if you come and you love me and you obey my word, I'll come and we'll have our abode with you. James 1.22. But be ye doers of the word and not what? Hearers only. Do you know there are people, maybe they should have a church like that. Hearers only. Here is only assembly. And I bet you if I had a church that, with that name, here is only, the church would be packed. No obedience, quiet, just come. Worship God. See, that's the whole philosophy behind the seeker-friendly movement. Come as you are, God accepts you just as you are. No, he doesn't. If, here's my question. Here's my question. If God accepts you just the way you are, why does he require you to change? If God accepts you for just the way you are, why does he command us to put off the old and put on the new? Yeah, God will accept you walking down the aisle of repentance to this place called Calvary and bending your knee and submitting your life to him and getting your life right with Him, and confessing your sin before Him, and admitting that you are a sinner, and that you need His forgiveness, and that you need His grace in your life. That's the thing that God hears. People don't like that kind of preaching. But it's the truth. You cannot have God and the world you will die and go to hell. You cannot accept the things of this world and the carnality of your flesh and, and say, well, I'm going to still serve God, but you know, I'm still going to you know, take a little bit of a, you know, a world life too. I'm going to do my thing, my way. Come on. You know, the earlier preachers that had revival, where they saw men and women outside falling down in repentance, was because they preached the truth of God's word without compromise. And God's, God, when God's words preach hallelujah, people will, they don't want some mamby-pamby gospel. People, some people want the truth. Amen? I mean, if I was a car salesman, and I came to you and I said, Hey! I've got a car for you, okay? Let me tell you a little bit about it. It needs new rotors, okay? The engine's falling apart. Exhaust is falling off. 
doesn't have good brakes. Transmission is giving a little bit of problem, but you know what? I'm going to sell it to you for five ninety nine. How about that? Isn't that a deal? You wouldn't buy that car. They don't do that. The devil doesn't do that. See, the devil lies to you and I and tells us you can still be the way you are and God still will accept you. God will still love you and you can still make it to heaven. No, you won't. You can fool yourself as much as you want to. You can fool the people of God as much as you want to. You can fool yourself as much as you want to. But you cannot fool God. Come on, somebody. Getting quiet. See, that was the problem. And we've done that in the New Testament time. We've done that in the in the dispensation of grace. Well, God, you, you know, uh, gee whiz. You know, I like it. Let me just give you a, te a little testimony. We, uh, it was uh, past appreciation. And someone came up to me after service and gave me a Pentecostal handshake. If you know what a Pentecostal handshake means, uh, see, I come from the time when that used to happen in church. You don't see that happening anymore, very rarely. But Pentecostal handshake, and you know what? I wasn't working at the time, and that really helped. But the, for pastor appreciation, someone came up to me, and they said, Brother, pastor here. They gave me a Pentecostal handshake, and I looked at it, it was $100. And they said, but I tried to argue God down. In other words, they wanted to give less. <laughs> now, now, here's the thing. Now, here's the thing, okay? I, I love the honesty. I love that honesty, okay? But she was trying to bargain with God. You can't bargain with God. She said, well, don't, don't thank me. Thank God because he wanted me to give it to you. But see, we fight God. And then when we, we fight God, we, we don't get blessed. Now, I'm not asking for $100. Two, yeah. Well, the Bible says, "Bless the prophet, and you shall prosper." So, but anyway. Um, but I'm, I'm, my point is this: Don't bother with God when it comes to being obedient. What's the area God's putting His finger on your life? Let me ask you this question. How many of you got savings accounts? And I don't want to know how much is in there, but everybody, anybody got savings accounts? Yeah, you all got savings accounts. What if God told you to give it all away? What if he told you, I want you to give it to missions? What if he told you, I want you to give your 401k to missions? All of it. You know what? You're going to see who really is surrendered and who isn't. You're going to see who really loves God. Come on. Oh, I've done that. Many times. God said, give away your car. Huh? Not, not once, more than once. Give away your car. Give away your living room set. Just bought it, Lord. Brand new. Haven't sat on it for maybe three or four months. Yeah, but I want I want to I want to bless that person. Linda and I sat on the floor for what a year and a half, a year, year and a half, in our living room watching TV on the floor. See, I'm telling you things that I've done. I'm not telling you something out of a book. We've sacrificed. We've given. I've given my whole week's pay. And I'm not saying that to boast to you. I'm saying that to show you. That when God requires something from you, don't hold it back. And I'm not talking about money. 
I'm talking about obedience. That's right. You tell it just like it is, little preacher. Yeah. I wish I could preach like that. <laughs> so cute. I can pinch those cheeks. What area is God talking to you? No, you're too young yet. You're still in the stage of innocence. You don't understand a thing I'm saying. She's giving me raspberries. But what area is God talking to you about? And I'm not telling you to give away your savings. No, I'm not talking about things like that. But what about your personal life? What, is God, what has God told you? I want you to stop this thing. I want you to end this thing that you've been doing. I don't want you to do it anymore. Come on, somebody. And you go walking down the street thinking, well, I'm still going to do my thing. Your thing will kill you. Are you hearing me? Your thing will kill you. You know, the Bible says when lust is conceived, you know, when I say the word lust, everybody thinks sexual. Lust is not sexual only. You can lust for things. Positions. You can lust for the Bible says when lust is conceived. Wow, you mean there's a conception? Yeah, there is. It conceives and seed thought in your mind. When lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. When sin is conceived, it brings forth what? Death. And you wonder why. There are areas of your, our lives that are not growing in grace. It's because we're allowing the seeds of lust in our minds to be conceived. Can I tell you that's the only time abortion is okay? You need to abort that seed that's in your mind of thinking that you can continue to live that way and God is still going to bless you. You've got to get rid of that. You've got to abort that seed in your mind that says it's okay for me to continue in my life the way that things are going. You need to abort that. Get it out of your mind. Take authority over it. Get rid of it. It doesn't belong in your mind and in your thinking. To obey is better than sacrifice. Now watch this. Let's go to Hebrews. I'm looking for a scripture, so let me see if I can find it real quick for you. Hebrews 10. That just popped in my head, so I wasn't planning on it. But Hebrews ten twenty nine. Well, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go to verse nineteen. Let's go to verse nineteen. Having therefore, brethren, boldness or confidence in some uh, translations to enter into the holies by the blood of Jesus. Do you see there was a life given so that you could have access to God? Huh? Do we take it for granted? After seeing all those murders growing up and seeing life doesn't really mean that much anymore? Has that desensitized us to the death of Christ? Does it, is it, is it still mean the same to you as when you were first born again? Did it really? 
has it really impacted you or is it just a traditional thing that's spoken in church and it's just a religious thing that we speak about in church? But you have, you have a, a confidence to enter into the holies by the blood of Jesus. It cost him his life to give you that privilege. It cost him his life so that you could pray to God. Verse 20. By a new and a living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Next verse, please. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with what? A true heart. So if Christians can have a true heart, they can have a a false heart. What is the false heart? Thinking that they can approach God their own way with all the junk that's in their life and not care. Just keep going on the same way over and over and over. Having our heart sprinkled from all evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast. Let us hold fast the what? the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Next verse. And let us consider one another to provoke. Oh, wow. That's not, the, that's not the new philosophy of the churches today. You're going to provoke somebody? No. You're just going to love them. Just accept them. I just love you, sister. You know, I, I'm I'm not going to point out anything to you because you know I just love you. I'm not. I'm, I don't. I'm not loving her by doing that. I'm not. I'm not helping her. But I'm going to provoke her unto love and good works. I'm going to encourage her. I'm going to tell her that God has a plan and a better better path for her if she's on the wrong path. I'm going to tell you, you need to get right. That's love. Telling somebody the truth in love is the right way to go. And to promote you to good works. Well, you know, I don't feel like picking up that sister. Come on, man. Do it for the Lord. So many times, Linda and I, you know, we'll be home or we'll be want to do something. Something will happen. And she'll say, man. I say, honey, just do it for the Lord. Just do it as unto the Lord. She has a little bit harder time with things than I do. Because I'm just used to, I just give and give and give and give and give. Linda will walk two miles with you like the Bible says, and after the third mile, you are on your own. Okay? I'm working on her, though. Sometimes I drag her to the third mile, and she's like, okay, all right. You know. But, I'll go four miles. I'll go five miles. But then if I see somebody taking advantage of me, guess what? Cut off. That's it. Done. Next verse. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. What that means is get your sorry little self out of bed and get to church. Come on. Well, I come to church on Sunday, Pastor. Oh, good for you. What's wrong with, what's wrong with Monday? What, what, what's, what's wrong with Wednesday? Hello? Now, if you have a legitimate reason because you work, that's different. But if you ain't working and you ain't, where are you? Well, I, I go to church on Sunday, Pastor. I'm, I'm there on Sunday. Oh, I see. Sacrifice is better than obedience. Well, I don't have to be in church every day. Oh, say not to send yourself together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another, come on, let's get to church, come on, let's get there on Monday, let's get there on Wednesday, let's get there on Sunday. Man, I, most of you people, even on Facebook, you couldn't hang. 
when we first got saved. We were in church every single day. I was in church almost every single day. Monday was youth. Tuesday was a service somewhere with Brother, with brother Norman. Wednesday was morning manor. Thursday was Thursday night Bible study. Friday was home group fellowship. Saturday night service at, at um, uh, 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 in Freetown there. Right? Whatever the Pentecostal church there in Freetown. And then Sunday morning was driving Brother Norman somewhere Sunday night. Sunday morning was Zion. Sunday night was somewhere else. I don't lie. I'm telling you the truth. And it's not because I had to go do those things. I wanted to go do those things. I wanted to be with God. I wanted to be with God. Oh, we could sit for Dunkin' Donuts for eight hours and talk about Jesus. We could sit at Lums for six hours, seven hours till two o'clock in the morning. Oh, but when we're sinners, oh, we can go out to the nightclubs, man. We can stay out till two o'clock in the morning drinking and falling all over the place and go out to eat afterwards and stay up till four, five, six in the morning. Hello? Who am I talking to? We can get down tonight, right? We can party tonight, right? We can go out and do all our thing. But come to church. Oh, well, you know, I can't. Sunday's enough, you know. Sunday. Sunday's my thing, you know. I just come on Sunday, you know. Sunday's my thing. Next verse, please. Oh, wait, go back, go back, go back, go back, 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 Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the number of some is. There's a number in the church that don't think they have to be here on Monday and Sunday, um, Monday and Wednesday. Hello. But exhorting one another... Come on, lazy daisy, get out of bed and come to church. See, she, I, I do, Pat. <laughs> I wasn't talking to you. I was using an example. Why, I feel guilty? <laughs> She's just in her face. I don't what I do, Pat. <laughs> and so much more. So much more as you see the day approaching. What day? Coming of Jesus. Exhort you to come and be in church. We use the most excuses you want to hear. Well, you know, Pastor, I had a hangnail on my toe. Oh, I had such a hangnail on my toe. Oh, I can't work. Oh, I can't do nothing. I can't go to church. Hey, we're going to Six Flags. Hey, can I come? <laughs> come on, somebody. I mean, come on. Oh, I can't go to church. Oh, my leg on my leg. Oh, too bad we're going to six five. Oh, we're going. Can I come? Next verse. For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifices for sin. Now that word sin willfully doesn't mean a one-time deal. It means if you continually, repeatedly live in that way and you don't care, you have an attitude about it, God's going to accept me the way I am, or that's just too bad for God. Let me tell you something. You are lost as a goose. I don't care what you do. Next verse. But a certain fearful looking afar of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Next verse, please. He that despises Moses' law, <coughs> excuse me, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. And verse 29 is the one I want to get to. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall be, he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Bless you. Come on, somebody. 
how much sorer punishment suppose you shall be thought worthy of who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. That's what Saul did. He counted it as an unholy thing. By living contrary and thinking that the sacrifices were going to save him. And have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. You can despise the Spirit of grace and trample the blood of Jesus under your feet if you live in that kind of attitude and thoughts that Saul did. He just offered the sacrifices without even caring about the voice of God, what God said. Are you willing to say to me this morning, I don't want that, Pastor. I want to obey God's voice more than anything else. More than my will, than my thoughts of my ways. I want to obey God's voice. I'm sick and tired. Let me tell you something. I don't know if you saw this on the news. But Donald Trump came out and he, he said on, uh, on television, on live television, that he is backing Israel and he is moving the embassy of the United States from, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Can I tell you, this is the beginning, hallelujah, of the temple being rebuilt. I'm telling you, it's coming again, hallelujah. And when these things begin to happen, he said, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Come on, somebody. I want you to know Jesus is coming back soon. I'm not, this is not, it's not just words. It's, you know, sometimes I feel just like Noah. You're speaking, you're speaking, you're speaking. People are not listening. People are not listening. People are not listening. They're going on their own way. They're doing their own thing. But it's going to come a time, can I tell you, there's going to come a time when the door to the Gentiles is going to be shut, just like the Ark of the Covenant of God was shut. When that Ark was shut, man, and I told us to Linda one time, and she was like, wow, I never saw that. That when Noah went into the Ark, the Bible says the door was shut. And when that door was shut and that water began to rise, you can see the people running toward that Ark. When, that, when the water was up to their ankles, saying, this is true, it's true, God's judgment's coming, and banging on that door and saying, please, let us in, I'm my four children, let us in, let us in, let us in. But let me tell you, it was too late. Once the door shut, it shuts. Because God shuts it. God is about to shut the door on America if America doesn't make things right. God's about to judge the church. Like he said, judgment will begin in the house of God. That means judgment's going to begin with you and I. Come on, somebody. He's going to start judging Christians. Oh, well, yo, that's not good. That's not loving, brother, pastor. That's not very loving. You know, you're too judgmental. Oh, really? God said he's going to judge the church. How's he going to judge the church? Through his servants. Through his prophets. Come on, somebody. God's going to have a voice. Hallelujah. Wherever there's an Ahab and a Jezebel, there's an Elijah. Hallelujah. He's going to use his servants, those who are willing to stand up and speak and don't care how big their church is, don't care about their monthly budgets, don't care about how much money's coming in. They're going to speak the truth with love. And they're going to tell the people like it is because the, the, the ark door is closing. You know, I don't think I don't think Noah went around. You know, you know, when 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 God told him, you know, build an ark because I'm going to flood the earth. My judgment's coming against this people because they're people of violence. I don't think he just went over and said, uh, "Excuse me, sir, uh, do you think you might like to come in my my ark that God told me to? You know, God loves you just the way you are. You just come in my ark just the way you are if you want to." You think he did that? I don't think he did that. I think he warned them. The Bible says he was a righteous man. People today wouldn't be in the church that went something like this. If you don't repent of your sin, you're going to die and go to a flaming eternal hell forever. You better repent right now because God is angry with you. I ain't going back to that church no more. You see what that... That, that man's angry. He needs to go to anger management. 
They don't want to be in a church like that. What? God loves you. He wants to prosper you. He wants to bless you. Don't be thinking negative. Be positive. <laughs> God loves you just the way you are. Come on, somebody. Obedience or sacrifice. Some people live half and half. God wants it all. Can I tell you, we're coming to a time. Listen to me. I'm going to speak this to you, and I believe it's prophetic. Okay? We're coming into a time where you're going to see so many Christians falling away from the faith. You're going to see it. And the reason you're going to see it because the devil knows his time is short. He knows it's time to end. He knows that he ain't got much time left. And he's coming out with everything he's got to discourage you, to make you uh, feel weak, to make you feel that God doesn't love you, to tell you all of the things that are, that are, uh, uh, are going to happen if you continue following God with your family. But my question to you is, do you like this life more than you like eternal life? I speak to those on Facebook this morning. God does not want you living in sin. God wants you to be free from sin. God wants, God wants you to, to know that sin will not have dominion over you. But you've got to be a fighter. Are you hearing me today? You've got to be a fighter. Don't be a wimpy Christian. Don't be a wimpy person. Oh, God, I can't help it. <laughs> Stand up and fight. Give the devil a black eye. Tell him, you ain't going to have me no more. You ain't going to direct me no more. You're not going to influence me no more because I'm a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're not going to have your way in my life. Stand up to the devil, hallelujah, in the power of the Holy Ghost. Stand up in the name of Jesus that is above every other name, hallelujah. Stand up and say, no more depression. Say, no more feeling sorry for myself. No more of that anymore. I take authority over it in Jesus' name. Command that depression to go. Command that anxiety to go in Jesus' name. Stop fighting. Not in your strength, not in your ability. You can't, you can't move a muscle but fight in the strength and the power of his name and of his authority in your life. Brother Bob, play something, will you? Once you hear the music, that's your time to escape. That's what people do, they escape. Boy, you go now. Sometimes they're running from conviction. They're running. They don't know. Don't take the sacrifice of Christ's blood for granted. Come on. I think it's like 68 percent or 70 some percent of Christian men are uh, addicted to pornography. Christian. You know how that happens? One look. Ooh. I'll tell you, when you're on the beach, you've got to be very careful. I'm serious. I've, I've said, oh God. Many times. Oh God. What? What? I told him, I said, why? They don't shouldn't wear nothing. Look at it. Oh.
Let me ask you a question. Are you fed up yet? Are you sick and tired yet? The way you are? You need change? Don't trample the blood of Jesus Christ and the holy things of God under your feet. You may say, I can't live a life. That's right, you can't. Let his let the life that he puts in you come out. That's your responsibility. Let that eternal life that's in you come out. Let it bring spring forth. Let the new man put off the old man, put on the new man. I believe this with all my heart. God spoke to me one Monday night here. So I want you to begin to remove the barriers. And we did that and we saw four answers to prayer right away. Right away. Now I believe that God wants to move, remove far more barriers in our hearts and in our homes and in our lives and our finances and whatever it is. In our addictions. But it's time to face up. There's no more hiding. No more hiding, looking good, you know. Hide everything. Looking good. No. It's time to face it. Good movie if you ever want to watch it, Facing the Giants. Come on up, I want to pray for you. Lord, I pray that God you move on your people. If you're tired, if you're battle fatigued, if you're worn out, come right up here right I want to I want to say this too, okay? As you come. Don't lie to God. As you come, don't lie to God. Cuz God is just just as able to kill you as he did in the nice and fire. Don't lie to God anymore. Anyone else? lie to God anymore. It's time. It's time. Time to face the giants. You all know why you're here. I don't know why you're here. It's none of my business. Whatever it is that you see, you want God to change. And I know there's things in me that God needs to change too, and I want Him to change. No more games. No more fake outs. I mean by fake outs, they fake people out. You say one thing, they go do another thing. God sees that. Don't trample the blood of Jesus on your feet. Don't despise the Son of God who shed His blood and gave you life. But honor Him this morning. If that's, if that's what you're going to say, yeah, I'm going to honor God with my life from this day forward. When I touch your head, just say, yeah, I do, Lord, I do, I do. Say it. In the name of Jesus. And let this commitment be said. Let it be done. In and through the blood and by the blood of Jesus. I thank you, Father. I want you all to lift your hands at our this altar right now. Go sit in your seat. Just raise your hands up. Say, Lord, you heard my words. 
I utter them to you and you only. Not to the pastor, not to this church, but to you. From this day forward, God, I'm going to live right. Hallelujah. I'm not going to point somebody out but somebody in this line. You need to ask God for the things you do in secret. There's a, there's a secret that you've been keeping. You need to ask God forgiveness, restoration, to promise Him that you're forsaking Him from now on. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, no more pretense. In the name of Jesus. No more pretense. Can I have someone spiritual? Can I have someone spiritual come up and stand behind someone here? Come on. Rebecca, can you come? Just stand behind someone and put your hand on them. Just begin to pray for them right now. Come on. Come on. Out loud, just begin to pray. Whatever God puts on your heart, just begin to pray. It's a body ministry, not a pastor ministry. 